I'm just going to get started by asking you a question about, you talked a lot about the fluidity of microbiomes in various creatures, including us, and that this great story of the nori digesting Japanese um, gut bacteria. I'm kind of interested in how, how stable our mm. microbiomes are and how they evolve like that, and how can we know what microbiomes were like, I don't know, 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago? Yeah, that's a great question. So... Um the, the, the adult microbiome is actually surprisingly stable. It's, it's odd. It's both stable and dynamic. So uh, a child's microbiome goes through these waves of changes over three years before finally setting down into an adult phase. And actually, those waves are very predictable. So if you look at like a newborn island or, or a fresh or like a charred forest, you'll see that like mosses and lichens will colonize first and then shrubs and then trees. And you'll get this predictable wave of colonists. And that's called ecological succession. You see the same thing in our guts. Again, we are ecosystems. We are like a newborn island. Over three, those first three years, predictable waves of new microbes rise to the fore until we enter this adult state. And then from there on, a lot of those strains that live within us are actually pretty stable over time. There's this baseline of stability, but there's also a lot of dynamism. So the microbiome changes uh, over the course of 24 hours on a sort of daily rhythmic cycle. It changes whenever we eat. It changes when we encounter new things. When we shook hands earlier, you gave me some of your microbes. Thanks for those. And when I touch this desk, I pick up some from the desk. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> And yeah, there, there, is this, there is this constant change, but it occurs over this, this background of constancy. Um, what was the other thing you asked? Oh yes, uh, so the evolution of things inside us. Um, that actually is, a, I think, one of the future frontiers of this line of research, how the complex microbiomes within us evolve over short periods of time, over, say, an individual's lifespan. We know that those kind of horizontal gene transfers I talked about, the ones that left the uh, sushi digesting genes inside gut bacteria, those types of transfers happen much more often on the human body and in us than they do in the wider world. And that actually makes a lot of sense because we concentrate microbes in dense throngs within us. We create this bustling marketplace in which they can trade genetic wares. Um, so we, in our, just by existing, speed up the evolution of uh, the microbes that form partnerships with us. And there, was, there was a paper just this week, I think, that I heard on the news about chimps in captivity, mm, that yeah. th their microbiomes are beginning to resemble modern humans rather than chimps in in the wild. Yeah, so uh, this, this looked at uh, a couple of monkey species and um, it compared the microbiomes of wild individuals and captive individuals. And you see that the captive ones have what they called a humanized microbiome, which is, has both a, a literal and a figurative sense. So the literal sense is they actually pick up microbes from the human handlers in, around them. But the figurative one is that they have a much narrower range of microbes than their wild cousins. They have a lower diversity in their gut. And that parallels changes that have occurred over human uh, civilization for the last you know, tens of thousands of years. Uh, we in urban Western cities have a lower range of microbes within us than, say, hunter-gatherers. And hunter-gatherers, again, have a slower diversity of microbes than uh, chimpanzees or gorillas or other apes. So there's been this gradual winnowing over evolutionary um, and societal timescales. And then one of the big questions is, does that matter? It's very, very easy in a very knee-jerk way to think that what was once, what was old and historical was better for us and that because of our modern 21st century existence, we are dooming ourselves. But there's, it's not actually clear whether that's the case. To some extent, it might be. There's a lot of idea that um, there are many ideas that uh, by disconnecting ourselves from old microbial partners, we are not educating our immune systems at an early enough stage, and so we end up with twitchy, overreactive immune systems that are more likely to react to things like allergens in our food or dust or what have you, which might explain why um, allergic and inflammatory diseases are on the rise over the last half century. But it's also the case that the microbiome is very, very adaptable. So as I said, it's quite dynamic. And over time, people have changed the way we live. Um, we eat a different diet. 
um, you could argue that the Western diet is a, is a poor uh, shadow of like, the healthy one that we used to eat. But I think you would be hard-pressed to say that, say, a hunter-gatherer was eating much more poorly than uh, a chimp or a gorilla. It's just that our diets have changed and the microbes within us have changed as a result too. Whether those changes are bad or whether they just reflect adaptation to what we have given them, I think is unclear. In the same way that, um, you know, myopia is more common now. We're more short-sighted than we used to be. But we also have things like glasses and contact lenses to mitigate those problems. Um, so maybe we, we have different ways of dealing with that reduced diversity. OK, let's have some questions from the floor. Can we, if we could have the lights up. The first two mics I went to, the lady in the third row with the turquoise top and the gentleman uh, with the blue shirt. Um, and then if you could pass it down in front of you both times. Thank, thank you very much. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, very pleased to hear all that. Um, we do know, I'd heard it before, that um, the uh, faecal transplant can attack um, C. diff. Is this where we're going to get the next generation of antibiotics? That's a really good question. Um, I, it's not clear whether the, uh, the microbes in the donor stool are producing antibiotics that kill C. diff. I think it's probably more likely that they're just taking up space, that they're better at establishing themselves in the gut and thus crowding out their competitor. But honestly, we don't know. But it does look as if that uh, it does look as if our microbiome is a really interesting potential source of new antibiotics. Um, there was a really cool new paper that I wrote about recently about a nasal microbe that uh, was that produced an antibiotic that has never been discovered before and that seems very good at destroying uh, MRSA. Um, and the nose, uh, these scientists argued, is a very good place to look for new antibiotics because. Unlike, say, the gut or the mouth, there are very few resources in the nose for a bacterium to, to consume. It doesn't get washed with food all the time, unless you're eating in a very strange way. Um, and so organisms that live in the nose have to be very, very competitive. They have to have very good ways of beating their rivals. And antibiotics are one of them. All of our antibiotics come are originally microbial weapons. They are weapons that bacteria use to destroy and suppress other bacteria. And if we look at parts of our body where that competition is extremely fierce, we might be able to find the drugs of tomorrow. OK, gentleman in the blue shirt back there. Ed, um, how much does what we consume affect um, the formation of our own micro microbial uh, environment? I mean, you said, uh, firstly, that um, if we take uh, probiotics, for example, it has, it's, a, it's a, a breeze blowing through and it has very little impact. But at the same time, you said the mother feeding their child is right. setting up an environment that has a fundamental impact on the development of that microbial environment. Mm -hmm. There are lots of, of folk remedies that have been around for many, many years that people swear by mm -hmm. as having an uh, impact upon their health, mm -hmm. but have had very little scientific research to demonstrate that, they've had, that they have fundamental changes or they have fundamental me medical bases. Can these be things that are fun basically affecting the microbial environment that we mm. don't know sufficient about that are causing those, those benefits for us? Yeah, may, I mean, maybe. So the, you, there are, you can eat like fermented foods. People have been eating fermented foods for all, for, for, since time immemorial. Those are effectively probiotics. Um, you could eat foods that are rich in fiber. These, there are, there are products out there called prebiotics, which are things that are meant to nourish microbes selectively. Um, but the entire, the entire fruit and vegetable aisle of the supermarket is a prebiotic aisle. Fiber nourishes microbes. Breast milk is a prebiotic. It does the same. Um, so yeah, the things that we eat uh, strongly influence the makeup of microbes that share our bodies. Um, we still don't know enough, I think, to be able to work out how that happens in a very predictive way, to say, you should eat this thing in order to nourish these microbes, which will do this for you. We're still in such an early phase of this, and I think we, we cannot give that kind of health advice. And I think in just in general, like my feeling with dietary advice is that the more specific it gets, the more likely it is to be wrong. So people who say you should eat this berry, this random berry, and it will do great things for you, Eh, 
people who say eat lots of plants, lots of fiber, that feels like pretty sensible advice to me. It's also advice that has been around for a very long time. The microbial world uh, reinforces the importance of that, but it doesn't provide us at the moment anything radically new that we could incorporate into our diet to improve our health. It's all the age-old advice we have. And as to the thing about um, you know, uh, other, forms of, other forms of medicine, um, I think there's this tendency to see the microbiome as, as a mechanism, as a, way in which, as a way of explaining connections between things around us and our health. So people want to know like, why, say, inflammatory bowel disease is on the rise. And they might go, oh, it's the microbiome. Or like, why certain foods do certain things for us. Oh, maybe it's the microbiome. And I think the microbiome doesn't really work as a self-sufficient explanation in itself. Because then you have to ask, what are those things doing to the microbes? And then what are the microbes doing to us? It just adds like two more questions when there was just one. So I think it's, I kind of think it's a false way of, of, of um, trying to answer those questions. You can't just say, um, this thing that we didn't understand before, maybe it's to do with the microbiome. In fact, it just, the, adding that microbial element just complicates the question a little bit more. Okay, let's crack on and get as many in because there's lots of hands okay. up. So I think the gentleman in the front row was next. And if you pass the mic back uh, one row when you're done, and not that. Um, you, you said that the uh, use of antibiotics was like shock and awe. Mm -hmm. And uh, it sort of raises a question in my mind. How come it doesn't make us a lot iller than it does? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, ecosystems have a thing called resilience. Um, you can dent them, but they bounce back. And the same is true for, I say, a forest, uh, which can resist fire, all sorts of problems. Same is true for our bodies. So antibiotics do change the microbiome, but often it changes back. And especially when we're in, an adulthood, in adulthood, the it reverts to a state that is kind of similar to what it used to be, maybe a little bit different. And what's unclear now is how many of those dents it takes to actually shift it permanently into an irreversibly altered state, like, say, one that is overrun by C. diff. Um, so I do want to stress that antibiotics are a good thing in general. They have you know, saved us. We, we are running into problems because we lack good antibiotics. Um, but the, the thing that the science of the microbiome teaches us is that we need to be more judicious about the use of these drugs, that um, we should stop taking them for conditions where they are not designed to treat, like viral infections, for example. They, they have costs as well as benefits. Okay, gentleman with the hole in his trousers. Sorry, <laughs> right. it's, it's the only thing I could see. <laughs> um, given that multicellular life evolved in the presence of viruses as well as bacteria, mm -hmm. and they're so weirdly different to bacteria, do you think a lot of what you've said about bacteria applies to viruses? And do you think when it comes to sort of the holistic poo, when it comes to fecal transplants, do you think actually it's the delivery of viruses that both, say, infect us um, and the bacteria as well, the bacteriophage, which actually makes a sort of richer... Yeah, this is a really, really good point. There are lots of people who are studying the virome, the viral component of the microbiome. It's kind of understudied at the moment, but there is stuff in the book about viruses too. Um, there is one really interesting guy called Forrest Rower who uh, did a lot of the coral work that I talk about. He has this idea that um, we actually, that um, there are... Uh, so the question of mentioned bacteriophages, these are viruses that infect uh, microbes, that infect bacteria. They're called phages for short. And Rowe's idea is that phages in our gut almost act as part of our immune system. There is a layer of mucus that covers the wall of our gut, and it contains large numbers of these things. They look a bit like um, the lander that we first sent to the moon, like a, a kind of globe with a long spindle and like spindly legs. And they sit there with the legs sort of waving outwards, almost as if to like grab microbes that pass by. And his idea is that these... Um, these viruses help to control the population of bacteria in our guts, but also that they help to select which species get to live with us. Um, so they might well be part of our, our microbiome. They might be symbiotic parts of ourselves. Okay, doke this gentleman here. Hello, hello. hello Hi. Uh, well, there's one point you're making through your, your talk when you're talking about bacteria causing or being involved with lots of different human diseases. The one that I was most surprised at was type 1 diabetes, which I always thought was almost certainly purely an autoimmune, assuming it's not mitochondrial. 
And I don't know how, could you explain more how mycotes can be involved in an autoimmune disease? Yeah, so it goes back to the thing I was talking about earlier that um, our, our immune system gets built and calibrated by microbial influences. Um, so it sets the ability of the immune system to correctly respond to threats in the world around us. And a lot of autoimmune diseases are caused by our inability to sense friend from foe, by overreacting, by, uh, by, by uh, pro producing a lot of inflammatory in, uh, immune responses to harmless things. Uh, whether it's allergens in the air we breathe or, or those in the food we eat or, in fact, parts of ourselves. Um, and actually, the type 1 diabetes um, link is really interesting. It's, very, it's, being, uh, it's being studied very intensively uh, by a lot of people, I think, in, mainly in the States. Um, and there's a lot of interesting long-term studies where you, take, um, where you take infants and you follow them over a long period of time and you show that, uh, they've showed that a lot of these microbial changes predate the onset of symptoms. And you can also do some of those transplant experiments I talked about where you put those microbes inside mice and you see um, a lot of those symptoms being, uh, being recapitulated in those rodents. Um, so, yeah, I think a lot of those mechanisms are being worked out, like actually how this happens. Um, but there does seem to be an interesting connection there, not just with type 1 diabetes, but with other autoimmune diseases too. Okay, now I think it was passed down another row. And do we have any on this, this side here? Any hands up so I can just reassess? at the back there. Um, and any in the cheap seats? <laughs> Do we have a mic up there? There's one up there. Okay, one of you guys is going to have to run up there in a minute. Just throw the... Okay, so this gentleman first, then this lady, and then Hi. one of you is going up there. Hi, yeah. Um, thanks so much. I mean, there's, there's a, a lot of things I could ask you, but uh, I was just thinking of something more general because I, I really appreciate your fascination with science and science facts and how it's, you know, you transmit it really well. And I, I mean, for example, when... I, I was a kid, I remember reading that, just this very simple fact that if, if the Milky Way was the size of North America, the solar system could fit into one teacup. And mm -hmm. I remember reading that when I was eight and it blew me away. Mm -hmm. uh, but I want to ask you, like, you know, you dedicate your life to this and you know, you have so many and there's, there's still some one that blows you away that you'd like to share, just one <laughs> science fact put um, on the spot a little bit. It's a good time to ask you this. So when, I, when the first person who interviewed me about this book asked me this question, I just went, uh. Um, well, okay, maybe, I've got maybe, a fact for you. Maybe you could debunk the, the, one of the things that a lot of people like us talk about sometimes. The 10 sometime. to 1 thing? The 10 to 1. The 10 to 1. Yeah. Okay. I, I will give you two things very quickly. So there's the 10 to 1 ratio. So a lot of, a lot of, one of the most famous facts about the microbiome is that we have 10 bacterial cells for each one of our human ones. And you may have heard me say 1 to 1. Uh, this idea that we are 10% human is a lie. Um, it is a fake fact because people um, a very <laughs> many decades ago basically took a made-up numerator and shoved it on top of a made-up denominator and created a beautiful baby factoid that was then passed on through the generations as if it was actually true. And it's not. It, it's made up. Like The, the latest uh, wrote, study to actually that. try and look at this question found a one-to-one. -one. Um, in many ways, it doesn't matter. It just means that there's lots of them. Um, you know, it's a difference between lots and lots. Um, but it goes to show that um, the, the thing about facts in science is, is sometimes misleading. It's always changing, um, and, and a, lot of these, a lot of these numbers can, can be misleading. But here's one thing that really does blow my mind that I didn't talk about. Um, those sap-sucking insects I showed you include a group called the mealybugs, and there are several, including one called the citrus mealybug, which looks like it's, about, it's tiny, it looks like a woodlouse that's been dusted with sherbet. And it has bacteria inside its cells, as many of those other insects do. But those bacteria have bacteria inside their cells. So this is an insect with bacteria inside it, with bacteria inside its bacteria. It's like a Russian doll. And all three of those cooperate to make nutrients that all three of them need. So to make something like an amino acid, you need a, like a production line of enzymes. So imagine like a production line moving through a factory with um, robots moving along it that, say, add the chassis or the wheels or the steering wheel, like, and then build a car at the end. Well, these partners each build some of those machines, but none of them build all of them. So one bacteria will build like one, two, four, or five. The other one will build like three, five, six, and so on. And what the insect will build eight or nine. I'm making those numbers up, but that's the idea. It is um, 
one metabolic pathway that is shared between three partners. It's like the production line snakes in and out of three different bodies. And that is a degree of codependence that I find astonishing. You know, th that is, that is an a intimacy that I think is really hard to get your head around. So it just, I was just thinking when you were saying that, that wriggled and jiggled and wiggled inside her. There was an old lady who... Anyway, um, now, uh, the lady up there, and then, and then up. You, you'll have to wrangle amongst yourselves because we can't really see you guys. Thank you, Ed, for the wonderful talk. I'm interested in the process of writing the book, mm -hmm. and I wonder if, as a science journalist, you could uh, share a bit about the process of tackling such a vast subject and, and also what you learned as a science writer as opposed to writing you know, the articles for The Atlantic or... Or yeah. your blog at, uh, Before Ed answers that, I want to answer that. Because <laughs> not only were we waiting a long time for Ed to write this book, people who'd written books already were anticipating that he would complain a lot about it because writing books is really hard and really boring. And he didn't, and it was really annoying, <laughs> and he did it in a year, whereas it takes most normal humans about four years. And every time I'd ring him up or text him or tweet him and say, how's it going? And he'd be like, um, yes, fine, I've just finished. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, that partly happened because so many people, including Adam and basically all of my writer friends who had written books, talked about how horrible a process book writing was in descriptive terms that actually sound a lot like a faecal transplant, but without the health benefits at the end of it. Um, so, uh, yeah, I resolved to myself that I was going to do it on time and that I was not going to complain about it. Um, which I think I, I did manage to, to keep to. But the tricky thing about this field is that there are so many different stories you can tell. So actually finding the ones that mattered that I was going to talk about was, was a big challenge. And uh, I wanted to... And structuring the book was hard too. Um, so the, those of you who will buy the book, please all buy the book, um, will see that it's organised uh, in themes. So there's a chapter on, say, the way uh, bacteria help to sculpt our bodies. There's a chapter on the evolutionary opportunities they've given us. There is a chapter on those horizontal gene transfers I talked about. There is one on manipulating microbiomes. And those are the themes that I wanted to focus on. And all the stories within um, uh, go towards illuminating one of those. And I've done that because also this is a very developing area of science. And I didn't want to write something that was going to be incredibly speculative, that is going to just be out of date very soon, that was going to mislead people. I wanted it to um, stand the test of time. And I think those themes will stand the test of time. There's not going to be a study going to be published like next week telling me that microbes aren't important for animal development <laughs> or that they aren't important. You know, that, um, they, they, those stories, I think show us aspects of the microbial world that we need in order to understand everything that's going to happen in the future. And that's why I structured the book like that. In terms of the way you communicate with your readers, is it different to communicate through a book, you think? Um, uh, to, to an extent... Did everyone um, hear that question? Uh, so she asked if um, communicating to readers is different through a book than through, presumably, like, news stories. So, I mean, it... it uh, not not to a huge extent, because I'm still writing for the same types of audience. Uh, a book cannot be, um, like, a chapter cannot be a bunch of news articles stuck together. Uh, a book cannot be um, a bunch of features stuck together. It needs to have a rhythm and flow to it. And I hope you'll find that when, when you read it. It needs to zoom in and out, much like the, this field of research does. Best advice I was ever given for book writing came from a novelist who said, write the book you want to read. So I don't... I, you know, I don't know whether you guys like it, but I did. <laughs> okay. So, up in the balcony. Um, thank you. Thank you for the speech. It was very good. Thank you, silhouetted figure in the darkness. <laughs> <laughs> One of the slides, you had a picture of the Tree of Life. Yes. And there was a large purple section. Yes. That you said in the last few months, they've discovered most of it. Yes. I was wondering, why is it in the last few months? Has there been technological advancements? A new method has been used or... Why in the last few months has there been such a big um, discovery? It's because, um, so a lot of those uh, tags have come from one single aquifer in Colorado. Um, so it's not that people have gone all around the world and suddenly found this vast way of new things. They just looked somewhere that they didn't look before with amazing new tools and found this incredible new diversity of life. And I think we're going to see more of that. I really do. I think... Um, the, the big change that has revolutionized our understanding of the microbial world and has led to the microbiome being this hot topic of research 
uh, is a technological one. It used to be the case that we studied microbes by growing them in laboratories, by taking a swab and culturing them in like shaking beakers. And that is a crude method that only works for a small minority of the microbes in the world around us. But in the 1980s, I think, um, scientists realized that you didn't need to do that. You could take um, gen sequencing technology had got to the point where you could take a swab from, say, this desk, a bit of water. You could shatter all the microbes within it, take their DNA, sequence it all, and then identify who was there through genes alone without needing to grow or observe any of them through a microscope. And that was the technique that really opened things up, that showed us how much we had left to discover and allowed us to work out who was where, what genes they had, what abilities they had, how they were interacting with us. That changed everything. That is why the microbiome is like a big thing now. OK, more up in the galley. Hi. There was a very interesting documentary. Hello. Hello. Um, a few days ago on these identical twins mm -hmm. who had the neurofibromatosis gene and it had manifested itself very differently within their two bodies. And just listening to you, I was wondering whether or not there could be any link to the microbiomes as to how it had manifested itself so differently in kids who had theoretically been given identical genes and identical starts in life. Yeah, probably. I, 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 think, I, think it's, I think it's likely that it is some component of that variation. And there have been lots of people doing microbiome studies looking at twins to see uh, whether differences in their health and their fate um, are down to microbial differences inside them. Now, obviously, twins actually uh, do have more similar microbiomes. Uh, so identical twins will have more similar microbiomes than non-identical twins, which will have more similar microbiomes than uh, just roommates or, or couples. Um, but yeah, that um, even identical twins will have differences in their microbiomes, and that may explain why some have health problems and others don't, even though their genomes are exactly the same. Well, um, how do you see the difference in microbiomes in humans distributed across the world? I mean, you mentioned the Japanese, mm -hmm. you mentioned hunter-gatherers, but how localised are populations in terms of what their micro biomes and genomes look like? There are definitely differences. There are geographical differences. Um, I think diet is probably a, a greater driver of that variation. So the reason why hunter-gatherers around the world have a greater diversity of microbes is because they eat more plants. Um, not, but, to, not to do with access to the bacteria that they ingest? Yeah, possibly that too. Um, and you know, adaptation to local conditions. Lots of these things are probably important. Um, we can't answer that question as well as I would like to because, as is the way with a lot of medical science, a lot of it has been done on white people in rich countries. Um, so we still don't really have a great idea of the diversity of microbes in the human world, let alone in the world around us. But I think that will come. You know, that, it, it's the same with human genetics. Um, we, we had that focus originally and then it diversified over time. Okay, no, I think the gentleman in the purple t-shirt there. Ah, yes, um, you were speaking about the plant apples, especially the mealybugs, and how um, you know, they were so codependent on yeah. the microbiomes. So how does reproduction work when you're dependent on the bacteria to survive? Do you get yeah, as that's a, a, that's a really good question. Uh, see chapter six of the book. Um, <laughs> the, so a lot of those insects uh, pass on the microbes that they depend upon into the eggs um, that they produce. So even before the offspring are fertilized, even before they come into existence, they have bacterial partners with them. Is that sort of like a polar body or, or, or mitochondria? No, no, not really. It's sort of like... Um, yeah, you could think of it as something like that. So, so a mitochondria is, is a structure found in all of our cells uh, that provides energy. It's like a little battery, a little power plant. And um, you could think of these things as sort of on the way to becoming like that, but not quite there yet. Um, but that, there are many different ways of passing down microbes from, uh, from parent to child. That is one of the most intimate um, and it ensures that the youngsters are always have those microbes from an early stage. Um, but there are plenty of others too. Um, and again, you can find that in chapter six of the book, which has features things like koalas, sexy flies, and many more. Okay, the um, shadowy figure with the beard. <laughs> <laughs> you a sort of, well, after the Human Genome Project is finished and the Thousand Genome Project is on its way, can you foresee a genome project for the 
gut bacteria, human biomes? Yeah, um, so that actually has been done, sort of. There was a human microbiome project uh, that looked at the microbiomes of very different uh, body parts in, so I think, something like 250 people. Uh, amusingly, those people all came from uh, cities in America, uh, so it's the Human Microbiome Project in the same way that the World Series is the World Series. <laughs> hey, that's not fair. Canada are in it as well. That's right. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, there have been moves towards doing stuff like that. Um, more recently, um, uh, uh, the White House launched a national microbiome initiative, more aptly named this time, that's looking at the microbiomes of lots of different things, people, soils, water, animals. Um, but, you know, the Human Genome Project was a very specific thing with one very clear goal, sequence the human genome. The human genome is a thing that we can complete. Um, we haven't quite done it yet, um, despite what people think, but it's, it's finishable. The human microbiome kind of isn't really, because it's so diverse, um, it is so multitudinous, and it varies so much from one thing to another. So it's hard to think what the end point of a human microbiome project would be. It's more likely that we're just going to keep on sequencing more and more stuff, more and more people, and get a better idea of the diversity of the world that way. And if only there was a book about the Human Genome Project coming out next Thursday. <laughs> I had to say that because um, the, the mics had to cross the whole room. And we can keep talking for three, two, one question. There you go. Yeah, so thanks for a great talk. But um, one of the things that seems quite prominent that, that's coming across is there are almost two schools of the microbiome. So there's the sort of one where there's microbiome expression, in which you have the ecosystem and how that's expressed in uh, sort of human or however sort of disease well felt, or there's also sort of the microbiome in terms of the individual microbes that are involved. Um, and you were talking before about microbial engineering and the idea that you can manipulate a microbiome. And it almost seems as though um, what with the sort of like cocky and approach, the germ theory of disease was quite prominent in um, sort of our understanding of biology and our understanding of how like disease is spread. It almost seems as though we're at risk of saying that if you do, if you perhaps have this particular microbiome, then you are definitely sort of assigned to this. And whilst in the case of like Clostridium, that may be true, it almost seems that might be simplifying what is an incredibly complex um, ecosystem. Oh, for sure. And um, we, you know, as I said, we are still at the early stages of this. And what we cannot do yet is to take someone's microbiome, to sequence it all, and to say, this is what's wrong with you or to say, here is what your healthy configuration is, and how far, this is how far you are away from that, or what you need to do in order to get there. So it is not a predictive science yet. Um, we, we cannot take someone's microbiome and get a good, useful, informative readout of their health. We are not at that stage. Um, I think we will get to that stage, but as you say, it's very complicated. It will depend on lots of factors, like how those microbes interact with the host, how they interact with each other, all these kinds of things. Um, microbiomes, as we said, can, are very dynamic. They can shift from very different states uh, for reasons that we still don't understand. So, yeah, I... In, in the main, I agree with that line of thought. Um, I think that this is something we will get to in the future, but we're definitely not there yet. Okay. Unfortunately, that is all we have time for. But you must buy this book. It is, it is, it is masterful. Uh, one of the reviews that I didn't mention at the beginning from The Spectator described it as like reading a sacred text. <laughs> it's different from a sacred text because it actually contains facts. <laughs> Um, so Ed, Ed I'm, I'm will hoping, be... <laughs> I'm hoping that it's one of the classic good sacred texts rather than like Dianetics. No, it's like, yeah, it's the Book of Mormon, basically. <laughs> um, it, the book is on sale outside. Ed will be signing copies and we'll be milling around, but all that remains is for me to ask you to put your hands together and thank Ed Yong. <laughs> <laughs>